revelation that the government of Ghana has signed an agreement with China Harbor Engineering Company for building the extending the Chadijagan International Airport has caused some serious concerns among the public. In particular, the public is concerned that this government has signed an agreement in which things like toilet bowls are priced at over 400,000, a ur urinal, $300,000, sink, $125,000. Well, the government or the Ministry of Public Works and Communication, which in my view had no authority or capacity to sign a, an agreement giving away tax concessions, has responded by criticizing those who have made revelations as being anti-development. It then went on to explain that those persons didn't realize it was a lump sum contract and that the 424,000 it lists for each toilet bowl is in fact a full set. Well, let us examine these two points. A, that the contract was a lump sum contract. If we turn to the contract, we see that it says on page three, that on page five, that it's a condition of contract for plant and design build. Now that does not mean it cannot also be a lump sum contract. But what it does mean and does raise the question, if it is a lump sum contract, why do you need a bill of quantity running 35 pages from pages 41, page 41 to 75, itemizing practically every single thing, every piece of steel, every valve, every ton of sand, just about every item is in fact separately listed. That is not usual for a lump sum contract. The second thing is, it says, oh, we and the public have been misled in by sensationalization of what this document in fact indicates. As I just said a moment ago, this contract, apart from saying that it's toilet bowls, not even sets, so the public culture news is very generous by calling it toilet sets. This contract says they are buying 69 toilet sets at $2,121.06. That's over $424,000. Now, if you look between pages 41 and 75, You'll see things like structural works, you'll see walls, you'll see pipes, you'll see piping, you'll see fittings, you'll see valves, you'll see drains. All of those things do, in fact, are, are separately listed. So the government or the Ministry of Works and Communication really needs to have a better story. It needs to be able to come to tell people why it is we should be spending so much money on a contract with the Chinese that is nothing but a fleece. They need to tell us why in a contract where the to total mobilization expenses is less than a million dollars, we are paying the Chinese contractor over 20 million US dollars as an absolute upfront payment. Is that $20 million to be shared out among those who might have been participating in various stages of this negotiations and contract? This is very troubling. What is particularly troubling is the silence of many who ought to have taken a position on this contract. This contract 
was tabled in the National Assembly on March 15, 2012. Have our parliamentarians been asleep? Have our media been sleeping at the wheels and not taking this matter up? We the people, we need better representation. We need, when the government makes statements like these or enters into contracts like this, that we immediately raise our voices and say, look, we are the ones who have to repay the loan to the Chinese bank and who have to finance the contract to the Chinese contractor to purchase Chinese equipment, to use Chinese labor. In fact, the geniuses who did this contract have a strange wording. They have agreed that the relationship between Chinese labor and Guyana labor, Guyanese labor, should not be less than six to four. In other words, under this contract, we could have 10 Chinese and zero Guyanese, and it would have met the terms of this contract signed by the Ministry of Public Works and Communication. That is surely unacceptable. My name is Christopher Ram, and we're on the plane talk. My guest this evening on Plain Talk is historian Dr. Nigel Westmus, who is visiting Guyana, where he presented a paper to mark the 250th anniversary of the 1768 rebellion. 63. 1763 rebellion, sorry. Thank you, Nigel. The title of his paper was Comparing Burbis. 1763, and the Haitian 1791-1804 slave rebellions. Context, course, and outcomes. Dr. Westmus, thank you very much for appearing on Plain Talk, and welcome back to Canada. Thank you very much. Pleasure. How significant, Dr. Westmus, is the 1763 rebellion in the history of what has come to be known as Ghana, because of course, Burbis was a separate country at that time? Yes. Very significant, um, not only significant in Guyana, but significant in the history of slave rebellions. Um, Burbis, as you know, um, the rebellion in Burbis lasted for more than a year. And if you check global slave revolts, apart from Haiti, all of them have um, failed, either are quote unquote failed after a few weeks or, or the latest, and uh, they are an hour, hour, hours. So um, Barbies um, lasting at the time it did, the Barbies Revolution lasting at the time it did, uh, really uh, a significant revolt in human history, and that is why I think it is uh, re very, very comparable uh, to the Haitian rev revolt, um, which lasted, of course, permanently. And that is why I think that um, for, as, as we said at the conference, I think it's an important uh, topic to be taught from kindergarten to university and beyond to the general public um, to get a sense of the enormity of this revolt. I know we have done it in the past from the, uh, at least from the 60s, um, UC Quine has written, um, Tommy Payne, um, Vincent McGowan, Anna Benjamin recently, um, but I think it needs more public uh, scrutiny and in information about the revolt. Um, there have been a quite a welcome development at the Guyana Institute of Historic Research, which I presented at, where uh, children's school books of the 76th Revolt are now being published. And we, we also know of the work of Barrington Braffitt and his drawings in the Guyana Review and other wow. newspapers. But in terms of your question, um, 763 is enormously um, uh, significant rebellion, not only for Guyana, but for the Caribbean and, and, and the Americas. You know, when I was working with my um, assistant 
on doing these questions. She said, Mr. Ram, you know, historians are always people who are not very easy to interview. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in fact, um, I, I mentioned that, Dr. Westmus, because you have, in fact, gone on to my second question. <laughs> and that is, you, you briefly touched on it. If you had to place the 1763, and please correct me, is yeah. it revolt? Is it rebellion? It is, is it revolution? I would call it a revolution. It's a revolution? Yes. Why a revolution? Um, I think I've seen your paper use the word revolt as well, though. Well, when, if something happens initially, um, it's a revolt. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it will become a revolution. There are many, uh, throughout this history of slavery, there are many small plots of slaves either running away or um, you know, um, planning, and then it fails in its infancy. And that would be a, a revolt? Would, uh, well, that's a, 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 it would actually occur, but not go to the completion. Now, I would call semi century revolution because not only was it well planned, but it was also uh, seized territory. Um, there was negotiation between Coffey and the governor at the time. Uh, there was, nego there was a, a, a conflict, several conflicts, several battles. There were several military echelons of leaderships. And of course, there was the um, prolonged wait um, for um, ba other battles to occur, which when the, the Dutch finally sent the flotilla from Holland and from Suriname. So um, uh, the permanence of the revolution, in terms of its uh, salience, its, its plot planning, and its you know its legacy in in, in terms of slave rebellions across the world, I, I think it really really stands up to scrutiny in terms of a revolution. Yes. Okay. Um, the if I ask you to put it in the historical context, mm -hmm. back in Africa, in Asia, everywhere, how does, where does the 1763 rebellion or revolution fit into that international panorama of events? Well, it is, um, as I said, um, if you take, and we can come back to the Haitian Revolution later, but if you take the Haitian Revolution as a, a guide, um, the Haitian Revolution is considered the largest and the most successful revolution in history. Um, the slaves, you know, 500,000 slaves lived in the island, um, tens of thousands rebelled and, and uh, finally seized power after a very complicated process, which is, uh, takes a lot to go through. Um, but um, that, you know, ended in finally in victory. Uh, victory was not assured, it was very difficult, but it was finally assured. Burbies, uh, in similar context, um, uh, the fact that you were in a, uh, you know, the Burbies colony at the time, and you were taking on uh, very formidable forces, um, it's a, albeit a small colony in comparative terms. Remember, Barbies, there was about 4,000 4, plus slaves. There were 346 whites uh, in the colony at the time. Um, but as UC Quina said, um, numbers don't matter in historical events in that uh, sense. And, um, and, but in terms of global history, um, there have been revolts that are much larger than um, the Coffee Revolt. Um, Jamaica, for example, has a, has a record of having huge revolts, 1760, the Taki Revolt, um, the 1831 Revolt, the Baptist Revolt. Those revolts had a, uh, over 10,000, in some cases, 20,000 slaves rebelling. So they're in, in terms, but they, 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 la they didn't last uh, very long. And so that is why um, I think we tend to have undervalued um, the Coffee Rebellion, and that's why I was talking about its uh, dissemination of information about its legacy. I know um, Anna Benjamin has recent, written a recent book. I don't know, I haven't seen the book, but I think it would probably um, bring out new facets. I think we're now expanding information about 73 more and more. Um, some more Dutch records have been coming available, but um, a lot of, some of it we can't um, get back into the heads of Coffee and, and his, his fellow um, henchmen to find out what is actually, what they actually did. But um, it is, in terms of world historical events, it's remarkable. And I've seen um, his academic journals in the United States, which have uh, placed the Coffee Revolt very highly in that context. In 1762, uh, and again, <laughs> you um, <laughs> preempted uh, my question. In 1762, uh, uh, the, the population of Burbies, according to the official records, um, and excluding the Amerindians, which were still yeah. large in their settlements. Um, the records suggest that there were 346 whites, um, 244 Amerindian slaves, and 4,000 black slaves. Mm -hmm. 
how come a slave confronting um, a system where you know you risk your, your, your life you 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 kept well under control how did how what 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 was involved in that what organization was involved in well, slave rebellions in general, slave revolutions in general, um, uh, have many levels. I mean, I, you, you quite correctly asked the question about parity and, and conditions. Um, it is very, people assume it is easy that if you have the majority that you can easily revolt. Actually, it is very difficult sometimes when you're on a plantation system, uh, you're drawn from an alien place, um, you have to fight under severe conditions, you have uh, sometimes split, uh, you know, ethnic differences. You have to deal with... Uh, ethnic meaning they are largely tribal. Af African, yeah, African ethnic groups may, may, may difficulties may arise among them. Um, but there's a, a whole cornucopia of factors would, uh, pre you know, pr prevent uh, people from getting together and plotting against uh, 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 that flotilla. But when they do, they do it at grave bravery and um, at great risk because um, just the act of, look at the barbarism of most of the um, planter class and the, the, the Europeans who came, um, they're very barbarous in response to any act of resistance, whether it's by women or men, um, they, you know, you're whipped um, very severely. Um, I know this happened in, in, in Barbies, but just to give you a case in the Haitian revolt, which I compared with, um, one of the main slave leaders in the Haitian revolt, Dessaline, um, he was a field slave. And his back was corrugated with, you know, 400 whip marks. So it was raised, and it was, it was and I think that was built into his psyche. And his psyche was to take no prisoners. Um, and similarly, all through, you know, the, whether it's Dutch, French, British, um, Portuguese, whichever European state which held slaves, there was a lot of brutality. And so for slaves to, to consciously um, plan in secrecy, first of all, then to organize across sometimes great distances, as in the case of Barbies, because you know it's a very narrow river, um, required a lot of for planning and, and tremendous skill and also bravery, because um, the risk of um, taking up a revolt means, in some cases, means certain death. And in the case of the Haitian revolutionaries, uh, certain death was the final outcome um, for many of them after the revolt had been uh, um, beaten back after a while. Because one of the other difficulties, of course, they, they, they depended a lot on this, the plantation owners for their daily bread. Yes. Yeah, for example, in, in 73, when the revolt occurred, uh, after months into the revolt, uh, the question of shortages arose. Um, where do you get food from? Um, how do you organize? Uh, because you're, in one sense, you're freeing yourself from bondage, but in the other sense, there's a contradiction emerging because the people who man the plantations have food supplies that come either from Holland or from other uh, Caribbean colonies and, and they have to, when that is, when that is, um, that falls into short supply, you have the difficulty of, of hunger and how to manage the plant. It happened in, in Haiti um, in terms of sugar. Um, sugar, Haiti was the biggest producer of sugar in the world and um, just after the 1804 when the ha Haitians declared themselves independent, um, Nobody, it became a pariah nation. Nobody wanted to trade with it. Uh, Cuba gained from it. Jamaica gained from it. The United States um, took in emigres, planted emigres, and they benefited from the skills of the Haitian planter class and, the, and, slave, and black slaves who went with them uh, and colored. And so it's always an extremely difficult thing to take up arms and then hold it, and, and, and especially as a territorial state. And the Haitian, I remember the, the coffee revolt was a state for. Um, for because coffee was negotiating as a you know commander of the whole uh, Barbies for a better part of a year or, or up to the at least to the end of 1763 and thereby and of course the revolt lasts until June 1764. So you have that problem a practical problem that faces people strategic objectives versus tactical moment. How do you um, both survive, negotiate, and then produce? In the case of Haiti, uh, some uh, controversy arose because some of the leaders put people back onto the plantation, although albeit in a nice word, but essentially put because they had to produce sugar to sell. So here it is, you have freedom, but at the same time you have the practical problem of what do I do with this freedom? Um, what do I do as a state? Can I produce sugar? Who do I sell it to in a hostile environment? Remember these are blacks who are freeing themselves in a 
far distant place from the no, not, kingdom. Not okay. aware, not accustomed to the well, they mercantile became, system. Yeah, all. One of them, many of them are skilled. I remember a lot of, uh, of Africans and, and uh, became, of course, Creolites and and they knew the they knew the rhythms of the plantation very well. No, no, I'm talking about the international mercantile. Oh yes, system. the mercantile. Yeah, they they refused to. They would um, they would boycott or they would. You have to understand that there was also racialization of, of, of after you oppress the people for 400 years and bring them across as slaves, the color scheme came into being. So it was being a front. It was an affront for Napoleon Bonaparte to negotiate, for example, with Toussaint Louverture, because here it is a, a man declaring himself commander of a country which he once owned and wants to say, let me negotiate with you. And he said he's not tolerating it, so he sent his brother-in-law, General Leclerc, to crush it. And of course, Napoleon being who he is, you know, the Napoleonic complex, um, <laughs> couldn't stand that idea. And the racialization process of scientific racism, how dare uh, African slaves or former slaves decide to defy the powers that be in Europe and elsewhere. I, I think I should apologize to viewers. I, I really ought to have, uh, on, on a program like this, try to get a map of Burbies and, yes, um, yeah. and ask you to take us through yeah. um, how it happened. I, I do apologize, yeah. viewers. Could you, graphic, could you, um, my words, give us an indication, where did this take place? How extensive was it? Um, where did it range from in terms of either the quarantine coast or up the river? Well, there were there several, um, uh, I mean, scholarship is expanding on, you know, the nature of, uh, you know, where exactly uh, the revolts were in various stages, but the lower Burbies River, um, Plantation Magdalenburg, and the Kanji area um, were considered the places where the origin of the rebellion occurred. And then, of course, it spread to other plantations. I know the, um, your um, uh, your viewers wouldn't, um, the names might not come to mind, but some might, uh, Fort Nassau, Pierboom, um, all the way up to Dagarad. And, and this was up which river? The Burbis River. It's a wide, as, as Emma Benjamin said um, in one of her uh, earlier monographs, it's a wide, you know, snake-like river, and it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to organize a military uh, type operations there, and that's why it's so remarkable that the slave did it and succeeded um, uh, very, um, very emphatically in pushing the Dutch up to Dagorad. But of course, in practical human dramas, what happens, of course, you have individuals who negotiate, some who would be more um, Atta and Akara and another slave called for Fortun, for mm -hmm. Fortung. He was the one Dutch. who carried it on. Carried it on later on, 1764. Yeah. yeah, Dana Benjamin has a very good piece on that. Um, I probably the new book has more in it, but I, I didn't get to chance to look at that book. I tried uh, the usual place is Austin. <laughs> I didn't get a copy of it. But um, yes, but it's uh, without a map, it would be difficult to, but it's a very winding river and the, the slaves moved up to a certain point. Uh, they were pushed back. At one point, there were 2,500 slaves at one point fighting an, uh, an army, um, the Dutch. And, um, and some of the Dutch flotilla from Suriname pushed them back a bit. And then there was a long, extended, protracted negotiation, eight letters sent between Coffey and Van Hugenheim, the governor. And eventually what the governor was doing was stalling for time to wait um, an offer of coffee. There were several levels of negotiation, one to partition and you know, for each part to have one part and the, the, uh, the blacks to have one section or the ex-slaves. And, and of course the other thing to get them out, drive them out completely. So there are different negotiation tactics. And the governor quite cleverly um, knew he had um, sent a message to the Netherlands. Of course, in the Netherlands, it takes three months I, or more in those days. It's not the modern Twitter age. You can't just call the NSA to send a drone. <laughs> you have to, <laughs> you have to t send it. It takes three months to come and another six So it would take about six months to arrive. And while you're doing that, you're negotiating with coffee and, and panning your way out so you can um, reorganize and fight back. And that's what they essentially did. And they have, of course, superior musketry at the time. Uh, and they um, eventually... Um, because that would have been the main kind of weapon, wasn't it? Yeah, mouse Peter, but you had, um, as they call, machetes or cutlasses. You had, they used everything, you know, uh, possible... To Which is what the slaves probably would have had to rely on. No, they, they seized it from the forts, yeah. They would seize it when the first attacks occurred. They seized it from the forts and uh, redistributed them. I understand in one quotation, there was about 400 muskets were seized in one initial raid. And, of course, in those days, you have to uh, push a thing down it and, uh, you know, fire it and... 
And then, the, of course, the Dutch were in t total panic. Um, I think I mentioned it in the, and a lot of other scholars have mentioned it. The Dutch, you know, jumped into the river. They were, coffee, I mean, not coffee, Van Hugenheim was particularly upset at one of his, uh, uh, one of his generals who um, ran back to the Fort Helter Skelter without engaging the, the, uh, the rebels, you know. So there was a lot of um, give and take in terms of, um, and we can't put ourselves back then. I know there was a documentary did, um, done on the, um, on the 763 where they re retraced some of the steps, but it's overgrown now. Um, I don't know if ethnographers or archaeologists could find, um, you know, you know, nobody would know where the coffee is or where it resides. You, you know, they have the Kaikovral and you have the Dutch forts and uh, Brangwax still around. But it's very difficult to find bodies of people. So to reconstruct everything that we occur, we have to rely on the Dutch sources. So in other words, those who actually led the revolt wouldn't have their own testimony. So we are basically relying on Van Hugenham's diary and other reports from people who are engaged, the military forces who engage. Um, some reports from, you know, slaves who lived on and passed the oral message on, but basically you don't have a comprehensive sense of it. So there are some parts, aspects of the 76 re re revolution which is, you know, left in, um, you know, speculation. Yeah? But we'd have loved to hear Coffee's voice and Atta's, Atta's voice, and uh, you only heard Coffee's voice through the letters, but you don't hear all of the agency and the difficulties they had with each other. Did, did, did the rebellion take place at all on the quarantine coast? On the quarantine coast? Uh, there was, I mean, not on the, no, there was, there was maroon activity um, at the same consequent too and prior uh, afterwards as well. Um, uh, remember there were people running away from the plantation. Uh, Africans did not, human beings cannot take lightly to that form of oppression from the onset, whether it's the United States or Jamaica or Cuba, or St. Lucia, or Curacao, or Brazil, uh, Africans, or, 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 or uh, for the time being, let's call them slaves, ran away from the plantation and became free, and uh, as mar maroons. And that happened in, in, in um, Barbies, and it happened in, in Arara and elsewhere, uh, but especially in the area where Suriname is, uh, because Suriname had a very strong maroon presence. And then Guyana had um, a maroon presence um, in the 1790s for a while, um, but it kind of dissipated and some went to Suriname and that ended it. But um, other places remain for all time. I mean, Jamaica have Maroons still um, who are, are, the, are the relatives of Maroons who uh, fought the British and held their own territory. So when I was saying revolution, when I'm talking about territorial conquest of Burbis, I should make it clear, and I hope I'm not anticipating another one of your questions, but um, that Maroons actually held state power within a state. So they don't, I don't, I'm usually look, I'm looking at a case where somebody takes the entire territory in political terms, that is a state. So the Haitian Revolution was one where the slaves took the entire state. And Barbies, Coffee ha had the state of Barbies, the colony of Barbies for a greater part of a year. So in that context, but if I was to take into account Maroons, then you'd have to take into account Brazilian Maroons um, who lasted for almost a century. In you have to take into account the Jamaican Maroons. You have to take into account Maroons in uh, Harriet Tubman's uh, move, uh, movement of people into Canada and for freedom. You have to take into account Curacao and St. Lucia and St. Vincent and other places where people stayed in, away from the plantation and survived, uh, and very s cleverly survived with food, medicine, horrible medicine, uh, very clever ta military tactics, but they don't in, in the context of which I'm writing, uh, they are also very significant, but um, they're not, they didn't overtake an entire state, and that's why I have to make that proviso. You mentioned um, a, a number of writers, Winston McGowan, Alvin Thompson, Anna Benjamin. How accurate and reliable, from a historian's perspective, are the accounts of the slave revolt by these persons? Oh, they're, they're significant scholars. Um, I, am, I haven't, um, uh, you know, I've written about the 70th century revolt, but these uh, persons you named have actually published um, uh, on the revolt. Um, my speciality is, is actually more Haiti. But, um, but yes, um, Anna Benjamin, a scholar in her own right, Alvin Thompson has written extensively 
on and published many, many books on, on slave revolts, uh, uh, not only slave revolts, but journals of slave um, fiscals and, and other, um, the village movement, anything that's associated with human freedom or black freedom, um, they have written extensively and published in it. I, um, they're, they're extremely competent scholars and they've gone through Tommy Payne, you know, Tommy Payne is another one, they've gone through uh, the archives and really uh, checked on the, um, the accuracy. And of course, as historians do, they it might change slightly over time. You know, it's like when uh, C.L.R. James wrote The Black Jacobins in 1938 on the Haitian Revolution. Now, some of the things in his book could be modified to, with new information. Um, similarly, those scholars you mentioned um, would modify. Um, that's why I'm anxious to see um, Anna Benjamin's new book on the 76 Revolt, because there may be new information which I have not privy to about the revolt, uh, from new records you know, unearthed in Holland. Um, there may be new perspectives, but those are remarkable scholars in their own right. Um, uh, we, we read recently Richard III. Oh, yes. His body was exhumed, found. Mm -hmm. as, as a historian, are you satisfied that our government and our country and I'm not talking PPP government, PA. Yeah. we're talking about as our country. Do we, have we done enough? Is our University of Guyana doing enough to enlarge and expand the knowledge we have of these historic and tectonic events? Well, in all due respect to the, my colleagues at the university, they have to um, regenerate and expand the university itself. <laughs> Yeah, um, to, to a, a premium level to even to get to that level. Um, well, no, but uh, people are doing things uh, even under the most difficult of circumstances. Walter Rodney once said, you know, that, um, uh, even the conditions of the archive, people still produce and stuff like that. So, but no, I, to answer your question, I don't think enough has been done. Um, you can't place, you know, universal blame. I mean, it's a long historical process. Our archives are always badly kept, at least for a particular period of time. Not all of it falls on administrators, some of it falls on, as one of the presenters was, was saying last Saturday, that the way in which Penn wrote on some of the doc documents, for example, um, eroded the paper, and so it would deteriorate after a while. But as, as a young, at the time, um, archivist, I mean, uh, historian working from the University of Guyana under Professor McGowan, I would venture into the archives and be very disappointed with the conditions of the newspapers and old documents and stuff like that, and the preservation of same. Um, it is a very, um, a very, very hard thing to see uh, your history being blown away either by Wodans or by, you know, people dropping the it's newspaper. Like, it's like losing your soul, isn't it? That, yeah, exactly. And th that is why, um, you know, his world first, uh, uh, which has the head of the Guyana Institute of Historical Research, um, when we brought, it was a, a Dutch um, a researcher came in to uh, help to connect the Dutch archives with our archives and try to expand that um, uh, stuff we have. But it's a long, long history of, of complaints about our archives. It's not a new thing. This is going on for ages. Uh, we have never managed to find that complete interest. Martin Carter has spoken about it. Um, uh, historians have spoken about it. Uh, some political people have spoken about it. Uh, but it's still, we're in a, still in a state of anomie in respect of um, not only the archives themselves, but the history that comes out of those archives. We want, I mean, I, I, a, nation, a nation like Ghana should, should need to want a desire to know our history, whether it is the 76 revolt, which is the most remarkable event, I think, I would say, in Guyanese history. The um, most remarkable event. I would say suggest, so historical event. Yes. Um, or the revolt of the, you know, the people at Enmore, um, the 1889 Sand Bread Riot, the, um, the village movement, the arrival of, of Indian indentured laborers and what they did in, you know, in developing Guyana, um, uh, the Portuguese, um, in, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the Portuguese indentured laborers, the Amerindians. Um, there's a lot of historical uh, frames from our peoples which are not being documented and disseminated in a way that I think um, is very essential. Of course, as, as, as time recedes, mm -hmm. it becomes that much more difficult. Yes, of course. Yeah. Now, two things. Uh, in Barbies, it was largely the Dutch. Mm -hmm. They would probably have 
a lot of the a lot of information still. Yeah. The Europeans were, were were masters in 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 documenting records. Mm -hmm. um, from what you know as a historian, have we exhausted our examination of the records in Holland? Oh, by no means. Um, uh, I think the recent initiative uh, by one of the presenters who came, he, he gave some uh, a digitalized uh, record, so I don't know if it's Van Hugenham's diary, I couldn't remember what, exactly what he was handing over. But um, it's very important that it, it's digitalized. And, um, um, but yes, um, we have cooperation. I mean, the London archives have newspapers from our past, and we don't have them here. Um, we have scattered some of them. We have 1905, then you would have 1907 is missing. A lot of that must be very facts. frustrating for for a historian. Oh, it is very true. Sometimes you um, you feel so guilty because you're allowed access to um, archival material from 1905 or 1907, and you turn the page, and that's the end of that page. And you, 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 you I mean, in, in those days, you didn't have a camera to take pictures, so I had to take notes. Nowadays, I can use uh, the iPhone to uh, capture the image and, uh, you know, print it out later. But it's uh, very frustrating not to have easy access to periods of Guyanese history, which are there. And, and, and you ask the question, it's built into the whole national ethos. Um, how much do we as a people want, um, how do we want to be included in our school curricula? Um, how don't, do we include it in our, how many, how many of our parliamentarians know our basic history? I mean, that's a, that's a critical issue. Um, and that's why sometimes I feel very <laughs> uh, guilty coming on here to talk about history because people tend to want to talk about the current. And um, you're in... <laughs> <laughs> yes, which is antithetical to history. Yeah. But, but is it that we are soulless? We, we Philistines, we, don't, we seem not to care? No, I, I don't. See, I don't think, I think it's if information is available to young people and they can develop, I mean, if you, uh, my colleague David Hines went to Haiti and he told me that when he was there, he's, he's fascinated by how Haitians have a sense of their history. They know about Dessalines, they know about Toussaint, they know about the revolution, they know about uh, what the Haitians did in relation to the three armies, because three armies were smashed in, in Haiti during the Toussaint Louverture Revolution. And ordinary Haitians, whether they speak in, in the French Creole or in official French, or, you know, um, they, they, they can respond to you in a, in a minibus or their version of a minibus about Dessalines, and they can talk very proudly about Dessalines. So, CSO, yeah, so I'm asking you about Guyana. Yeah, I know you're asking about Guyana. I don't think there is that. Um, I, what has happened is that uh, there's been some amount of um, politicization of events. For example, the Enmore workers who rose up. Um, I want to keep weary of, they are martyrs, but I keep weary of the word and martyrs because it's been, in a sense, galvanized around a particular political event, rather than a thing that we shared by everyone. Uh, Coffee initially, the same thing applied. The magnificent work of, of uh, Moore at the Square Revolution was at one time politicized in the context where, you know, um, it was seen as, a, uh, as something owned by the state. Uh, what we need in Guyana is a, 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 a position where we reach, where we can both identify with the Enmore um, uh, monument and the coffee memorial with equal ease and with pride um, across race. But of course, that's a very difficult um, thing to achieve at this time. For all the deficiencies, um, what lessons can we learn from the 1763 revolution? As you said, by now, it has earned itself the terminology revolution. Well, um, one of the main things about it is that the, it's a question about unity. Um, uh, the legacy, apart from the history of its whole uh, the challenge it posed to the Dutch, um, the people who formed the revolt, Coffee, Atara, Akka, uh, Atta, um, Fork, Tung, and all of the others, um, uh, were, had challenges that we probably see in the present, that is, uh, difficulties of unity, and this happens in Haiti, equally happens in Haiti as well, um, difficulties of challenges of how to um, manage after revolt, after taking up arms, how to maintain organization, maintain unity in their ranks. 
uh, the human drama, as UC Kwanit would say, being played out. And so it's very difficult to put yourself back in the past and bring it to the present about you know, that challenge. But um, it is a, 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 one of the things that legacies of 73 is that if you read it carefully, you will see geographical challenges, you would see political challenges, you would see ethnic challenges, but you would see also the bravery of, 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 of that context where you, you asked in the initial question, how come they were there to challenge um, the Dutch supremacy? And the same thing applies in Haiti. How come you're able to do that? So that is it. Well, the other thing which I would probably anticipate to another question of yours is that I am very low, to, I'm very, um, in, since, I mean, yesterday was Karikam Day. Um, I would be very sorry if, you know, when we're discussing the Haitian revolution, I mean, the coffee revolt, that we don't identify with other regional revolts. Um, Haiti is part of the CARICOM family. And the Haitian revolution should also be learned by Guyanese school children and Guyanese scholars and Guyanese university students and others, because it's a remarkable revolution by any standard. And the fact that I compare those two, um, um, that I could identify in a longer paper, the comparison between those two shows how powerful coffee was, but also shows the drama of the Haitian uh, Revolution. And that, I don't want to be narr narrowly nationalistic and say, oh, all we need to know is about coffee and, and 1905 riots and 1924 Ryan riots, but we need to know about other Caribbean countries, the, the Jamaican um, revolt, 1760 and 1831, the Maroons, uh, the Haitian Revolution. Um, which, um, which is the most re significant remark. We'll, we'll, get there, we'll get there, yeah. so, uh, and ho overall I'd say that yes, we should both embrace the problems of the past, of the, the difficulties, and also embrace the heroism of coffee, and the same thing with the Haitians. Now, uh, as you said, you, 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 you've, you've returned, um, you walk around um, a country which, according to you, should be observing perhaps its most significant historical event. Do you think the country recognizes the importance of that event and the tribute we owe to coffee and the lesser known maybe fortune you, you mentioned yeah. at as well? Well, as I said, um, it should be. Um, I can't, I'm not a, I'm just making my small um, humble contribution to expanding knowledge base on the popular, hopefully, uh, at a, as the Institute um, the, uh, the National Library, but also as, along with other Guyanese scholars and writers, um, as I said, um, the characterizations of the 76 revolt and other rev um, human dramas by Barrington Braffitt are examples of how to try to visualize it and put it in popular, um, popular frame of reference. Um, so it's very difficult to, as I know, to go back and to say, oh, you know, if, unless you know all the, or it could be popularized, not only in a book form or academic form, but in, you know, uh, where we can come to the point where we can discuss it as proudly as the Haitians discuss Dessalines and Toussaint and know it fairly substantially. But to answer your question, no, I don't think it has reached that stage as yet. Um, people are preoccupied with their daily living and um, history can be seen as a... Or, or uh, the remaking of history. Yeah, or making of history. History is seen as a bad intruder when you're dealing with quote-unquote more important things like finding the latest DVD and a movie, <laughs> a new movie. Now, you've been, you were one of the um, young brigade for Walter Rodney. Yeah. Um, he did this iconic piece, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Yeah. Why can't we get an iconic piece on our own history? What keeps that back, Nigel? Well, it's a compli complicated uh, response to that. Um, uh, there's no s particular area you can define. Now, one of it, of course, is publishing and um, who publishes and, and how does the nation receive that particular piece of work. I, I agree. Um, Walter Rodney's book, uh, which was celebrated um, last year, by the way, the 40th anniversary of the How Europe and Developed Africa, which is one of the, again, like Black Jacobins from CLR James, a remarkable book, which has stood the test of time with a few provisos until today about how Europe engaged African, deprived of its resources. But to go back to your question, um, it's very, very difficult to pull things together and say, you know, we can um, develop a masterpiece um, <laughs> which can be appreciated by all. Masterpieces don't appear and become a masterpiece immediately. Uh, something Black Jacobins was written in 1938, which only became 
popularized in 1962 or after, you know, or 60s. 1960s became iconic, um, but it was written in 1938. Uh, we may have budding scholars and writers and novelists. Same thing with Edgar Mitchell Halls and all the other Guyanese writers. It takes some time for the or Martin Carter poem or a book to engage, and there's a process of engagement which is very difficult to put in any, you know. Well, let me uh, ask you, why did, um, why did How Europe Underdeveloped Africa come to be such a, a widely acclaimed piece of, of work? Because... Um, so shortly after it was written. Yes, because it was um, groundbreaking. One, two, Walter Rodney was known as a um, significant scholar by the, you know, the early 70s. And um, in that period of time, the third world was um, examining itself um, after independence movement in Africa and in Asia and Caribbean. Uh, people were talk, looking at historical things in much more depth. They're breaking away from the old paradigms of history, which looked at it as a you know, top-down kind mm -hmm. of history. And what Walter Rodney did was to engage history from the perspective of African kingdoms of the past and then showing the context of European engagement with Africa, and then showing the product of that, the disaster, the material resources taken out, both the slave trade and human and other resources eviscerated from Africa and taken abroad to in, in, embolden and make the Dutch West Indy Company more powerful and Barclays Bank and, and all of the other things. So that dialectical connection is there. And that what Walter did so well is to also write it in a way which is uh, approachable um, by ordinary readers. So I think that was the significance of it, and, and that took off from there. Let's divert a little bit, Dr. Westmus, and point a place this time of some significance. Fort Kaikoveral. Mm -hmm. Last weekend, the staff of Raman McRae went to this place, and apart from a bin up there um, and the sign saying, 1613, which suggests that we know quadricentennial, <laughs> a 400-year event of some importance is a historical place. Yet, uh, forget the landing as, as you go there, it, it's, it's all broken yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the sign is partly overgrown by bushes. Why is that event? not being recognized. This is 400 years. Mm -hmm. Well, as, as I said before, um, it's a part of the uh, national malaise. That go, yeah, again, I can't put it in any particular the process of disengagement with the history uh, that took place over a millennia. Um, it's not a new phenomenon. It's, it's more accentuated now. As I said, people are now in their private moments trying to, to deal with daily life, and they see those things as... You mean Philistinism? Well, um, I mean, you would have thought the tourism ministry. Mm -hmm. You would have thought the University of Guyana. You would, have, you would have thought the Ministry of Education. Somebody would have recognized how important well, this Well, let me give you an example. Was. I, was with, I was in Curacao last year, or, or earlier this year, uh, to do a paper, uh, no, last year, uh, to do a paper on, um, the, uh, um, on Marcus Garvey. And while I was there, I, I, the tourism Bureau plus the History Society of Curacao took us on a tour of the Isle of Curacao. And they have re-engaged, uh, re -re done all of the, there was a slave revolt leader named Tula. Um, uh, and they have done a remarkable job in making the historical artifacts available to, not only to tourists, but to uh, people from the Caribbean and general visitors to Curacao. And, and I think it's a remarkable thing. I, I saw, you could see, uh, you know, chain rings of slaves who are coffled. Um, you have old um, whips you, of, of planters. You have um, planter hat. You have uh, uh, loin cloth. You have even into the modern era t old um, old sewing machines at, at who house slaves used, all in glass cases and stuff like that, put up. And so you're absolutely right. Um, we can't just have a, a tourism which has to do with. Uh, we don't have beaches here, but I mean the types that. A North American tourists like to go to, but we, there's a lot of available material to bring historical perspective to tourism. And you're right that uh, a lot more could be done about weeding and and engaging those historical um, buildings. Well, I, I should say that when I came back to Georgetown, um, the very next morning, 
I tried calling. I, I, I've made at least six calls to the Ministry of Tourism. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've got no, absolutely no interest in this. And this is why I use the word well, maybe the, the tourism, Maybe not the tourism, but maybe the Ministry of Culture and um, or Tourism and Culture, right? Uh, or no, they, tourism is it. <laughs> Tourism is a separate ministry for okay. culture. But, but I don't think, I think that it should be broader than that. I think it should Education. be engaged by the University of Guyana and all, uh, partners should engage something like that. I don't think it should only be for the tourism purpose. It should be the Guyanese purposes as well. You know, that's what I'm trying to suggest, that it should be not only for tourism, but for us to go and... Well, no one seems to be doing it. As you're saying, possibly for. Yes. And it, Now, let us go to the other rebellion. As you said, there are, there are quite a few we've had in the Caribbean. Your presentation was called Comparing the Burbies and Haitian Slave Rebellions. Now, is comparing the correct word to apply in this particular case in terms of significance? Well, um, as I said in the presentation, um, comparison is a very, is a, is a very devilish um, uh, scholarship because um, you have different geographical contexts, you have different political frameworks, you have um, distance in from time. Um, so it's a very um, hard thing to do. But I, the more I look at the Haitian Revolt, and I teach it in, um, in, 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 um, in the United States, I teach the Haitian Revolt, I have a syllabus around it. Uh, the more but I not, at, not one about Guyana? No, not as, you know, I've incorporated it in terms of a comparative perspective, but not a total, because you're dealing with a different audience and, yes. like that, and you have to build it. Anyway, but the, the point I'm making is that when I saw Haitian, the Haitian revolt and I saw the Scoffee revolt, the remarkable, the fact that it predated um, the Haitian revolt is one issue, that, you know, the Coffee revolt took place before. Now, That's 30 something years? Yes, 30, 38 or something like that. Uh, 20, yeah, uh, and because um, it's 73, uh, 1791, the Haitian Revolution started yeah. and it ended in 1804 because it was so complicated, it had many stages. But when I saw the, there were some patterns developing the, the leadership of the revolt, Coffee and Atara and Atta having problems, uh, the ethnic issue, the military, the stages in terms of uh, uh, the battle plans, um, the decision to negotiate. In the case of Toussaint, negotiate with Napoleon Bonaparte. In the case of Coffee, they negotiate with the Dutch governor and to ask about territorial, concept of territorial state and holding uh, a nation state called Barbies. Um, those are remarkable um, human dramas uh, in their own right, and that is why I thought it fit in to compare them. I, call it, I don't think anybody has done it before. But we'll get back to that. These guys are supposed to be slaves. Yes. Did, did, is, they're discussing issues of statehood, oh, yeah. well, of governance, of government. Well, yes, that, to, for, for, that's for no ordinary no, achievement. Well, it's not only not an ordinary achievement, it's also a fact that many Africans uh, ha came from highly developed civilizations. Um, the Akan, for example, uh, in the area now called Ghana, um, were highly sophisticated states and had a very militarized culture. And it's no wonder that many of the rebellions in, the, in Jamaica, for example, where a lot of their Akan slaves uh, or Akan peoples went as slaves when they were captured and dragooned into labor, um, that they had a, a sort of a, a built-in military capacity and knowledge and oral history to deal with it. So it's not surprising um, they're, they're quote-unquote slaves for that particular production element, but they're human beings who have come with a whole quality of history and, and, um, and civilization with them. And so they're acting out those things um, in Im on impulse. Um, from the moment some slaves arrived in the plantation, they cut their actually tendon or uh, ingested mud or, or, or committed suicide or um, ran away from the plantation. Um, those are, you could call, pity, small acts of resistance. But there was complete resistance at all stages. There was, you can't put resistance in any one category. The Coffee Revolt and the Toussaint Revolts were organized military resistance on a large scale, but there are other small um, human resistance. And, and I, so the question about cultures, people, they had the, you know, the uh, uh, Akan, you had the Tembe, you had a whole set of civilizations, the Igbo, the Igbo, um, um, and uh, Angolans. So um, they're coming from 
well-developed places. Because remember, as you said, you mentioned Walter Rodney, and Walter Rodney said how Europe undeveloped Africa. Africa, if given its full logic at the time Europe entered it, would have been the superpower continent of the earth today if it was not denuded of its wealth. There's a view to some that the Toussaint Louverture and the Haitian Revolution influenced the anti-slavery struggle in South America. Is that correct? Not only South the, America, the, but um, um, throughout the The Americas. Bolivarian... Yeah, the, the team in Bolivar in 1816, they, uh, you know, the Latin Americans were up in arms against the Spanish colonization. And the Haitian Revolution occurred in, I mean, formally laid its ground in 1804. And uh, you had Desleans had passed away by 1806, committed, uh, was killed, assassinated. But by 1816, Alexander Petion, one of the presidents of Haiti, um, was engaged by Simon Bolivar to ask for help. And uh, one of the provisos given by uh, Petion to the Bolivar is that, yes, we'll give you arms, because we are agreed, we f fully are agree with you to take up arms against colony. We did it too. <laughs> but you must free the slaves. Um, and that was, a, uh, I think, that uh, uh, an aspect of the drama which was not kept by Bolivar and the comrades. The slavery continued in South America for a while. What conclusions, Dr. Westmus, would you draw from the two events, Burbies and, and Haiti? That, um, one, they should be um, read, um, understood, and um, discussed um, uh, as real powerful um, human dramas. Uh, of course, we are closer to coffee because we live here, but um, as I said, we are in CARICOM. I think that um, Haiti should also be studied by school children and others um, as a real tremendous human uh, drama which um, changed the world because when Haiti occurred, or when Demerara, I mean, Burbis occurred, um, it, it, it transformed the whole approach the Dutch had to the region, one. And in the case of Haiti, it transformed North America. The America you see today is largely responsibility of Haiti. Because after Napoleon was defeated in Haiti, he sold Louisiana to the Americans in 1803. And Louisiana then was not small Louisiana, it was a huge swath of territory. Yeah. And it made, added a half of the United States territory. And people don't give that credit to Haiti. And that is what I mean, the same thing in, in terms of coffee and his rebels. We talk very blandly about coffee. We just say 76 free revolt, and we celebrate it and, uh, in general ways, but we don't get into the nitty gritty of what it really meant. And that is why I was talking about what we used to call living history here, that we should see it as part of an ext extraordinary human drama which transformed both of them. Um, uh, Haiti more emphatically, because that I mean, Haiti survival today, the way it is today, is partly reflective of the fact that it took the courage to break the back of the French, the British, and the Spanish at the one period in time. Dr. Westmans, I'll ask you this question, not, not in your role as, as a historian, yeah. but as a social commentator and political activist, yeah, okay. which I think you still have yeah, in you. Yeah. Do you find it paradoxical that the two countries, Guyana and Haiti, that in many ways led the world in how to stand up and resist oppression are low down on the economic and social ladder of this region. Yes. And how do you Sorry. explain that? Well, um, you know, both different in various ways. Um, in the case of, in the case of uh, Burbis, and then it became two, three colonies in 1831, I mean, British Guiana in 1831, uh, we developed a trajectory where, you know, in a sense we, the Guyana recovered in sugar, became you know, a sugar basket for a long period of time. So there may be different um, results in both cases of what happened. But in case of Haiti, it's quite clear, um, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm speaking now as, a, as an activist, that Haiti won, but also had to deal with the, with the consequences of winning. And that is what um, I think they're living with the legacy today, um, uh, not only because of the the act of Desalines and company in terms of transforming Haiti, but the fact that they were dealing with their one little pariah in, a, in an ocean of sharks. And so it was very difficult to survive in that thing, but they did it, they did it. And so Haiti will come through, uh, I'm pretty certain. As, uh, I don't in the long lens of history. In the long lens of history, it has done fairly well in context. I mean, they have dictatorships and stuff like that. But there is some link between winning and quote unquote 
being harassed and being deprived. Um, not only because, but there's, there's always, always there's an invasion of Haiti, 1825. There's another invasion by the United States in 1914. There was a lot of economic pressure. So you can't just put the act of 1804, but you have to put a, a whole list of other issues that made his Haiti what it is today. But it's a very proud country, and I think we should try to achieve that level of pride, not only historically, but also contemporarily, and try to bridge that gap and make 76 really vibrate in the present. Dr. Nigel Westmus, this has been a fascinating discussion on um, two events of great historical significance, the 1763 um, Barbies revolution and the 1791-1804 slave rebellion of Haiti. I thank you very much and um, thank you I wish much. you your stay in Guyana go as well. Thank you. Operators and viewers, thank you. Good night. See you next week.